going to introduce Dr. and I've been told by others that Danes don't like titles, but you're on St. Croix, so we're going to live like Crusians. Um, Dr. Rike Andreasen, um, who is an assistant professor at Roskilde University in Denmark, and she has done quite a bit of research along the lines of race, the racialization, women, gender issues, a number of different areas. But she also wrote a book called Human Exhibitions, uh, which talks about the practice of human exhibitions at the Tivoli Amusement Park. And um, I came across, I don't think by chance, because I think God is always in charge, I was looking for a little more information on Victor Cornelius and Alberta um, Roberts, who were taken from here in 1905 to form an exhibition in Denmark. And so I came across her name and her book and got in touch and said, hey, have you any plans to visit St. Croix anytime soon? And she wrote back, working on it. And here she is. So we're happy to have her. Um, I'm going to turn over the floor to her. And then any questions that we have afterwards, she'll be happy to take your questions. So please help me to give her a Fusion welcome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Sonia. And thank you to the Landmark Society for the invitation. I'm really, really happy to be here today. On a summer Sunday in Copenhagen in 1901, 18,000 people visited the Copenhagen Zoo. They did not come to see the animals. They came to see a group of brown people, women, men, and children, who had just arrived from India to be exhibited in the zoological garden. They lived here in what was called an Indian village that they had built in the middle of the zoo. And they stayed there for three months, performing as themselves, which means taking care of the children, cooking, doing artisan work. And that Indian exhibition, it was called, marks the culmination of Danish exhibitions which started in the 1870s and went up to 1910th. And the background for my talk today is this book called Human Exhibitions, uh, Race, Gender, Sexuality, and Ethnic Displays. And the background for that book was that I found um, a forgotten archive in the basement of Copenhagen Zoological Garden in this behind, it was in the basement and no one had been down there since the Second World War. And down there were, like your library in here, times three, just like files upon files and photographs and lists of exhibitions and who were going to be imported, how they were gonna be shown, what the ticket price was, who were taken to the doctor. There was like this huge, Ar like amazing archive of information. And then I started digging into that story. And then it turned out very quickly that Copenhagen Zoological Garden and the amusement park Tivoli were the two major players in hosting these exhibitions. So that's kind of the background for my talk today. And then what I would do today is to zoom in on one of the exhibitions, which was an exhibition called Colonial Exhibition, a colony exhibition in 1905 in Tivoli, which showed a, a small group of individuals from St. Croix. But I'm going first to give you a little bit of background on the exhibitions just to situate that colonial exhibition. Um, my plan is also that I would speak, this is a plan I made up with Sonia, I would speak for about 45 minutes and then we'd have a discussion. And I really, really hope that we can have a dialogue about these things and, and, and talk about um, this event uh, of, of the exhibitions. Um, and, and I very much would like us to talk about also what does it mean for the relations today? Um, and then I would talk a little bit about the memory of the exhibition and what does that mean for, for Denmark today, but also for, for the Virgin Islands today. So, how did all these exhibitions begin? The period of exhibitions is sometimes referred to as the Hagenbeck era, because the German, Karl Hagenbeck, who owned uh, the Zoological Garden in Hamburg, was the major importer, importer of animals 
to the different European zoological gardens. Um, so he would support, the, he would su um, supply, sorry, supply uh, the zoological gardens in Berlin, in Hamburg, in Paris, in Copenhagen, in Stockholm, all through Europe with exotic animals, with elephant, and liger, lions, and tigers, etc. So he was a major figure in importing animals. And in, it's a not, it's 18, not 19. In 1874, um, Hagenbeck uh, says, a friend, and he writes this in his uh, autobiography, he says, a friend remarked that it would be most picturesque if I could import a family of laps along with the reindeers. He's importing reindeers. This seems to me a brilliant idea, and I therefore at once gave orders that my reindeers be accompanied by the native masters. So the idea of, of importing people along with animal is, according to him, this idea, his friends say, wouldn't it be nice to import some labs, which we today would call Sami people, so these people in the northern Scandinavia, to import them together with the reindeers. And he does that. And he creates his first lab exhibition. We'll call it a Sami exhibition today. And he writes about this exhibition so he brings in all these reindeers and a little family, uh, a mother and a father and, and two children. And he writes about this exhibition. It never occurred to them to alter their own primitive habits of life. The result was that they behaved just as though they were in their native lands. They would set up and strike their tents as in their own country. It was most interesting to watch them catching the deer with lassos and to see the wonderful skills with which they draw the sledges. The milking of the deer was one of the chief attractions in this lapic exhibition, and the little lap wife created a furor when she, in all her nativity and without being bothered by the audience, breastfed her child. Our visitors were unspoiled people of nature. So that's the very first exhibition he does, and basically he, he have them just be with the deers and catch the lasso and then breastfeed to so take care of, of their children. And that is such a, a great success that he decides that he will, whenever he's going to import animals, bring people along with them. One reason is also that it's not economically, financially, it's not going so well with the import of animals. So you also think maybe this is a way that he, he can make some money. So he, after this exhibition, he sends uh, a message to his people in Sudan from where he gets most of the animals to ask them to bring people to Europe. And because he works with a zoological garden, he imports, the, the people are imported to be showcased in the zoological gardens. It's not because they're considered animals, but it's because that's where he has his connections. So he would import people, and then they would first go to Hamburg, then they would go to Leipzig, Berlin, in Germany, and then they will go to Paris and maybe some other French cities, and then they'll come up to Denmark, and then they'll continue up to Stockholm, Sweden, and then they'll go to Russia. So you would import a group of people, and they would travel around for three, four, five years to different European zoological gardens where they would live for, for some months, two, three, four months. Um, the first, so this, this, so the Lapig is the first, the second is the people from Sudan, which is called a Nubian exhibition. And it comes to Copenhagen a few years later, after I've been traveling to these other uh, European cities. And the later very famous Danish Arthur Hermann Bank writes about this exhibition when he visits it. Uh, and he writes, Mr. Hagenbeck's caravan is quite interesting. Animal importer Hagenbeck deserves appreciations for his interesting collection of Nubians, not to mention the camel and the warhawks and the collection of weapons, all exhibited by the roller coaster. It's all very educational and very dirty, but of course the dirt is Nubian. So it, it introduces a very long series of exhibitions. And when I started the work, I thought there had maybe been 10, 20 exhibitions, but the more I worked on them, the more exhibitions showed up. So I've tried to make this list of exhibitions. So with the year, what they were called, and the place. Um, and a lot of them is in Tivoli, which is this huge um, amusement park in the middle of Copenhagen. 
but there are also some in circuses, theaters, different places. And it's a very, very long Nubian, Chinese, Nubian, Moroccan, Laps, Sioux Indians, cannibals, Negro musicians, Sioux Indians, Gold Coast, Lap Lap, a company of, of Negroes. And, and I put the names here as what they were called at the time. Blacks, Dinkas, uh, Arabs, the Haram, Australian cannibals. It's a very, very long list, and it continues. Um, long, 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 long list. Um, some of it, most of it is in Copenhagen, but also Aarhus, Odense, so in the, in the provincial parts of Denmark. Um, these exhibitions had a very, very large number of visitors. They were extremely popular. Some of the numbers we know for the Indian exhibition, which I showed you the picture from, it had 180,000 people visiting. The very large exhibitions, we believe that between 100,000 to 200 Danes visited them. It's very, very, it's a lot of people at a time where you have 2.5 million people in Denmark and only half a million in Copenhagen. So they're really, really huge. And the number of visitors, um, there must have been a very large number of visitors because it was really expensive to import people and animals and build the, build the exhibition places. Um, so they had to have been really, really popular. Not only ordinary common people were interested in these exhibitions, the scientists, especially people doing anthropology, which was a new science at the time, were extremely interested in these exhibitions. And at the time in Europe, there was a strong belief in a racial hierarchy and a, and a strong belief that humans had developed differently racially. And anthropology, being a new science, had a lot of, of what was called armchair anthropologists, which would be back in Europe. And then they would study people in Asia, people in Africa, through the stories of missionaries or through what sailors brought home. So for them, it was extremely interesting to go to the exhibitions and study the people. And it was believed also that these people represented an earlier stage of uh, human evolution. And, and this, the idea of the racial hierarchy was that the European white male, and I say male because it was not the European white woman who was on top, it was the European white man who were believed to have developed the most, be the most civilized, be the most cultural, and then all other races were organized below him. So all the scientists would, would go and look at these exhibitions and, and have them confirm their idea ab about uh, racial hierarchies. One very uh, famous Danish anthropology called Rich, uh, William, William Dreyer, William Dreyer also went and looked at one of the exhibitions and his description of them also shows how he really believed that this, um, the different uh, development of people also can be seen physically and at the uh, people on exhibit. So he writes here, it's a Kyrgyz exhibition in the zoological garden and the Kyrgyz people are nomadic people in the, 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 on the um, plains of, of Russia. He says, the surroundings of the Kyrgyz room are multicolored and multisaturated because strong colors often combined so as to class are attractive for the less developed and less cultivated human eye. His nerves are not as sensitive as ours, so exposures must be strong to impress his eyes. That's why he loves the most bright colors. That's, why, that's something he can understand. Similarly, with his music, noisy drums, chattering tambourines, rattling bars, and ding-dongs, he doesn't want more than that. The soft, melodic music that attracts our more finely marked ears does not affect him. So it's, it's very clear how this idea of, of other people than the white Europeans being less developed is, is reflected in the physiological descriptions of other people. Um, it's very clear also how the racial descriptions of the exhibited people resulted in 
um, a clear division being made between the right European audience who could go and look at the exhibition and feel very civilized and very cultured when portraying the people on, um, on display as being very backwards. And most European countries were holding these exhibitions. And research has there's been done research on the other exhibitions also, and most of the time it would be the colonial power who would display people from the colonies. So you're typically having Paris displaying people from the France colonies. Um, and, and in Denmark, most of the people who were on display were not from the colonies, but, but this idea of, of making your own nation very civilized and very developed by presenting other people as very backwards is very obvious in the, the exhibitions. So let me turn, this is to give you a, a kind of background for, for the setting of this specific colonial exhibition that showed people from uh, the former Danish West Indies. It's an exhibition called Colonie Ustilling, so Colony or Colonial Exhibition in 1905. It's hosted in Tivoli, which also had a lot of the other exhibitions. The person in charge of the exhibition is, was this woman called Emma Gell. Um, she is now a very famous Danish uh, woman who is mainly known for books she wrote called Takt and Tone, which is about proper behavior, so proper middle class etiquette and proper middle class behavior. She was the leader of the Danish Handicraft Association, and they were the organization behind this exhibition. What they wanted to do was to have a colonial exhibition, like Paris had had a big like, colonial show, London had had the big colonial show. So they want Denmark to also have like, a Danish colonial exhibition. Um, Yeah, she is very well known in Denmark today, but almost no one knows that she was actually the person behind this exhibition. She is, and it's a much more um, prestigious exhibition than some of the other exhibitions, because it's her, but it's also the Danish crown prince, the Danish crown princess Louise, who is the patron of the exhibition. And at this exhibition, a number of famous and influential business people lent the support to the exhibition. Together, Emma Gell, together with the exhibition's president, who was a wealthy merchant called Moses Melchior, <coughs> they decided that they wanted to show some people from the Danish, the Danish West Indies. And her original plan for the exhibition was that there should be an adult couple who should be weaving baskets, and that there should be shown weaving baskets because it was the Handicraft Association who put on the show, so they wanted to show handicraft <coughs> from the colonies. <coughs> um, and they set up agreement with a man called Hansen, Director Hansen, who was a director from the Danish West Indian Company in St. Thomas, and he promised to help her with the exhibition. Um, and he also promised that um, the things to be sent for exhibitions sh could travel on his ships. And Melchior, who is the other person doing the exhibition, he has a business partner in St. Kreuz called Edward Ford, who also promised to help. So we have these two men, one in St. Thomas, one in St. Kreuz, who say we would help you do this exhibition. But nonetheless, it proves impossible to find someone going to Denmark. So it's like they look all over to find a couple who can go and, and weave baskets, and they cannot find anyone. So, Fro so Ford, who is here on the island, he writes back to Copenhagen. He says, handicraft workers are no longer seen in St. Kreuz because no one, nobody wants to buy such finery. They can certainly make many beautiful things, but they're only made for decoration in the home, not for sale on the island which is nearly extent in terms of better families. We don't know if, if that is why he cannot find it or because no one wants to go. But that's what he writes back. So they search and search, and they cannot find it. Instead, they send off Ram, 
sugar, jam, hats, embroidery, baskets to be shown, but they cannot find any people to send. So therefore, back in Copenhagen, Emma Gell says, I really need some colorit, some special attractions, some um, very uh, special color for, for my exhibition. So you have to send someone. If you cannot find an adult couple, then you have to send some children. And then they find an adult couple, they make agreement with them, they say we'd pay for your travel, we'd make sure you get accommodation, you'd get some money, but when they are to board the ship, the woman refuses to go. She's like, I I'm not gonna go. And then they get really desperate in Copenhagen because the exhibition has opened, they have no attraction, and then that's when they demand, you have to, you have to send someone, it doesn't matter who you, now you, you have to find someone and send someone. Um, and, and to me, I also think it's really interesting that they are not able to find anyone even though they really try hard and try to, to offer, you know, your travel accommodation, you'd get some money, that people are refusing to, to go to Copenhagen. So instead they sent this letter saying, um, Ford is, is writing back to Melchior in Copenhagen. He said, dear Mr. Melchior, on Tuesday, I received your telegram on sending two Negro children, which of course must be for the exhibition. I immediately sent off to work and have now found an extremely bright boy of six whose mother is glad to be rid of him as he cannot afford to, nurture, to nourish the many children she has. I think that the other should be a girl of five and awaiting tomorrow to hear from a mother who has a girl of that age. To be on the safe side, I have let it be known throughout the city, and I hope that someone will come forward so I can choose a nice girl. A Danish streamer, steamer will be arriving in St. Thomas around the 10th next month, and I have written to Hansen about whether the children can travel with it and with a person on board who can attend to them. I expect a reply tomorrow. Without more for now, I remain yours sincerely, Edward R. Ford. P.S. So that you may know when the children have departed, I would send you the word left, meaning two children departed. But if I only get one child, I would send you the word one, only one, chil which one child departed. And I also think it's quite interesting that he writes this thing, which is kind of like almost in code. So saying, so if I have two, I would say left. If I only have one, I, I would have, I would just say one. And I think it also indicates that he knows that it, it's morally and then legally might not be completely right what he's doing, that he wants to, uh, to write this in the code. So a few days later, these two young children, Alberta Viola Roberts and Victoria Cornelius, as he's known here, but in Denmark he becomes Cornelins because when they have to register his name, they mix up the U for an N. So in Denmark he's known as Cornelins, and that was also what he called himself. So a few days later, on July the 8th, 2005, the two small children are on their way to Copenhagen. And they arrive in Copenhagen on July 29th, via, they go via Hamburg, Germany, and the very next day, they perform in Tivoli. Most likely, but we, we don't know, but most likely um, it's economic incentives uh, of greater control over finances that makes the mothers send off the two children. We know that Victor's mother, and I don't know if you know all this already, and maybe you, maybe you do, and then I'm really sorry for, for saying it, but, but when I say all these details, it's because when I present this in Denmark, people do not know. So maybe if you know it all, then I'm sorry. Um, but Victor's mother, Sarah Elisa Allen, consent to send Victor um, in 1905. She was a young single mother with three children, and she worked hard as a laundress and also in the fields to earn a living. And food was scarce, and also child motility in St. Kreutz for families like hers was as high as 70% for these families at the time. We don't know if she was paid. We don't know 
uh, what she was told. Uh, I think it's very likely that she was told that her child would have a much better future and that he would be sent to school and that he would be well educated. But we don't know. We know for some of the other exhibitions, some people were paid, uh, some people were not. Um, we don't know. We know that the children did not receive any payment when there were an exhibition in Copenhagen. Unlike some of the other exhibitions, uh, some individual actually had contracts and did get pay. But we also know of some exhibitions where people did not get any pay at all. So it's very different from exhibition to exhibition, but we know that these children did not. The two children, Victor and Alberta, became a huge attraction at the exhibition. Um, and, and, and I think what also is important here is, is that they were not, I mean, they were not the first children to be showcased. They were among hundreds of children who had been on this exhibition. But what was unusual here is that they are alone, whereas the other children are going together with their families. These are being sent on their own being uh, four and, and six turning seven years old when he goes. And, and that is very unusual. Um, Victor, um, Victor himself has a different version of this story. And he wrote his memoirs in the, in the late 70s, and, and there he has a different story. And what he writes is that his stay in Denmark was a part of a long-term strategy for the educational system in the West Indies, where the Danish local authorities would abandon the use of Danish teachers on the island and instead take some local West Indies to be trained as teachers in Denmark, sent them back to the islands and reform the school system. So according to Victor's memoirs, that was the reason why he was sent to Denmark. He was to be a reformer of the educational system and he would come back to the islands to teach. But research show, uh, and, and also my research, that this strategy of reforming the system of education was not implemented before after he was sent. And I also would argue when you look at the letters where they write back and forth, we want children, there's nothing in there indicating that they're looking for someone who should be educated at teachers and sent back. There's a very specific demand for just finding anyone. If it cannot be adults, then children. So, so I think it is very reasonable to argue today that the reason why these two children were sent alone to Denmark was that there was a very strong demand from Copenhagen from Emma Gell about that she wanted a special attraction and there were poor West Indian families on the island who were promised a better future for the children and therefore consented to sending them off. Most likely, I think that, that Victor never knew about this other version of the story because he died before that actually became common knowledge. Can you that? that he, he died before that was, uh, be, became, uh, be, became, I said common knowledge, but I don't mean common knowledge because I don't think it's common knowledge, but he died before the research was done showing that the strategy uh, of educating uh, West Indian teachers in Denmark um, was implemented after. So I don't, I don't think he ever knew this version of the story. Victor stayed in Denmark for the rest of his life and him and Alberta remained there and the reason they remained there was because there was actually no plans about what should happen with the children when the exhibition ended. There was so much energy and effort put into getting children over, but there were no plans about what they should do afterwards. They were not shown alone, um, because a lot of the time when we talk about this history, it's, it's like it was only them. But they were shown together with an adult man, Mr. Smith, who also came from the island, and he came together with some, uh, <coughs> some uh, I think, uh, some donkeys and chickens, and he was, was living in, they call it a Negro hut, but many ways in the same way as I showed to the picture of the Indians, where there was a little constructed hut, and he had his animals. And there was also uh, a West Indian woman 
who would be working in a bar serving rum, and most likely she was living in Denmark. That she, she was not coming from the islands, but, but was the West Indian woman living based in Denmark who just went in for a job serving. at. So, so in that way, it was not only them, but of course they were alone. Mr. Smith goes back to the island after the exhibition uh, ends, and there's a long correspondence between uh, Copenhagen and St. Kreutz about what would happen to, uh, to the children because uh, Milke and Copenhagen wants to send them back. And he keeps arguing in the letters that I think the children should go back because I think they would have a better future in St. Kreutz. And Ford here, who has made the arrangements where the mothers say they cannot go back. I promised the mothers that they will not come back. And we don't know if it is that he has promised the mothers some great future that it's obvious that they will not get if they come back, or if he's worried that if they come back, they become his financial responsibility, if he has promised schooling or, or he has to pay for it. So, so we have them for, for a, a, some weeks when no one knows what would happen to them and, and they don't know what to do. And in the end, they are sent to a boarding school called Weissenhusen in Copenhagen. And the reason why they end up there is because the, um, the headmasters, a couple who are the headmasters there, have gone to Tivoli and seen them. And they know Emma Gell and Melchior. And they know they don't know what to do with them. So they say, we can take them at the school. So they end up going to this school, which is, and I have this picture of it here. In front of, this is the school, and they're down here. I don't know if you can see it, but do you have the two small kids down here? And it's also a school where all the students have all gone to Tivoli, who have seen them on exhibit there. So most likely, it must have been really, really uncomfortable to have your first day of school going back with all the students who have seen you being exhibited in a cage in Tivoli. Um, Yeah. So Alberta Viola Roberts goes to school there. When she finished, you finish that school when at the age of confirmation, and normally you're around 14. Then she and then she's sent to a. Um, it's the Crown Princess Louisa's home for housemates. It's this school making, like really. Um, sophisticated housemates, so not just like the ordinary housemate who just come in from the street, but a very well-educated housemate, so you can go and work for like the really, really upper-class people. So she's sent there to, to be taught to be a proper housemate, but she dies before that of tuberculosis. And she is buried, and this is the, the almost ironic thing, she's buried in Denmark on March 31st, 1917, so on the exact day where the islands are transferred. She's buried in Denmark. Victor, who is still alive, is attending teachers, uh, teaching college. And when Denmark sells the islands, the Danish authority wants to send him back because they don't. He, he belongs to the islands, so they want to send him back. He doesn't want to come back because now he has been spending like most of his life in Denmark. So there's these ongoing negotiations and he ends up staying in Denmark and finishing his teacher's education. He becomes a teacher. He teaches in uh, Nakskov, provincial Nakskov, and he becomes quite successful and ends up being the vice principal of that school. He also marries uh, a Swedish woman and they have three children. Uh, and there's nothing unusual about marrying a Swedish woman in Denmark because there's quite a lot of it, the neighboring countries, so a lot of people move between the countries. So he marries a, a Swedish woman and they have three children. And, and as you probably know, he um, has a lot of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and some of them have also been here and connected back with the St. Croatian family. Um, when I present this work in Denmark and my work in Denmark, um, a lot of people most people have not, might have some vague idea about we had these exhibitions, but it's not common knowledge how many we had and how organized they were. Some people have heard about these exhibitions of Victor, um, but, but very few people know the details of the exhibition. 
And when I, when I talk about the exhibitions, a lot of the time I get the reply where someone will say, oh, I've heard about Victor, he's a great musician, or he became a teacher, or it's this almost happy memory of Victor. Um, and there's very little knowledge about the conditions he was experienced under. There's almost no, there's no knowledge of Alberta. And there's also very limited knowledge of his experiences in Denmark, because he actually did experience racial discrimination throughout his life in Denmark. And that's not part of, of the common history of him. And I'm just going to give you a few examples from his, his memoirs, where he writes, with all of the outward success I had already in my 20s and 30s, one might believe that I was the world's happiest man, but no. Being different was still a great bother to me, and I was subjected to daily humiliation not with loud shouts as in my childhood, but with small quiet remarks. When someone passed me on the street, I was often told to go home and do my morning washing better, and others dropped witty remarks to their complaints or asked if the trained ape had escaped from the zoo. Why was I, descendant of Africa, a son of the blacks, washed up on these northern beaches? Why should I continuously be seen as a close relative to the ape when everything in my work and outside the school succeeded so well? So he has these very painful um, reflections in his memoirs about how it is to be a white man in Denmark. Oh, sorry, sorry, a white man in, sorry. Also, which is not very well known, was that he was actually uh, under attack uh, during the Second World War. Uh, and this is a, a quote from um, the Nazi, uh, the Nazi uh, newspaper the National Socialist, National Socialist, where they write, because this is, and now he is a teacher in Naxco. The year 1942, in which the race and blood related concepts in the new Europe take such a pivotal position as they do, it must be demanded that Negroes cannot act as teachers in the education of Danish youth. In the present case, Mr. Cornelins has been on his post for so long that he's likely that he likely stands to receive a very high pension from Naxco municipality taxpayers, if not the highest. We have provided here a new example of the system's madness and how it so greatly needs to be put in place in true Danish fashion. Not only must the school be cleansed of Marxists and Jews, but most definitely also of a Negro <coughs> among the large municipality staff of teachers. So it's, it's not a happy story of a man who becomes a teacher. Um, this is a picture of Alberta in school here with a map of Denmark. Um, but because it, it was not for Victor and Alberta, but for the school, it was quite a success to have them there because they, they did very well and they behaved very well. And because of that success, uh, the Danish colonial uh, power decided that more children from St. Croix should come to Denmark. And that's when they get the idea about that children should come and be educated as, uh, as, uh, in Denmark to go back and be teachers. So in 1908, Valdemar and George, and I don't know the last names, but Valdemar and George arrive in Copenhagen, not to be exhibited, but to attend school. And according to the plans, a number of children should subsequently follow them. However, Valdemar and George's stay was by no means a success. Um, the boys did not thrive in the new environment. They were very unhappy. They created a lot of problems. I, th I think there is also how do you how do you phrase it? But in, in the when they're described, it's not a story about that they're happy. It's about how they, that they create problems. But of course, it's it's because they're very unhappy. Especially George created a lot of problems. Uh, not attending school, stealing, being what you in Danish call a problem child, and he's sent back to the islands in 1911. Whereas Valdemar stays in Denmark and actually becomes very close friends with Alberta because they live together. Um, and, and I think, and, and I don't know this, this is just what I think, that Alberta also maybe took a little bit care of him because he had been the longer, or, or they connected and, and had each other, but they form uh, a, a close friendship, uh, and he stays in Denmark. 
But the, so the idea of sending more children from the West Indies to Denmark is abandoned. But the actual idea of sending children from the colonies to Denmark is not abandoned. So in the early 50s, 22 children from Greenland, which is also a Danish colony, are sent to Denmark. And these are picked to be like the best, the brightest, those which you think if you educate them well in Denmark and teach them Danish language, they can go back and really be the vanguard of the education system. So they are taken away from the families, uh, placed in foster homes in Denmark and being educated. And the result has been extremely traumatizing for them and their families. And they never, they did come back, but they were never uh, the forefront of, of teaching. They were extremely traumatized. The families were traumatized. And only like recently have, have we also begun to deal with that part of our history. So if we move back to the exhibition in Tivoli, then Victor writes not very much. It does, it's, it's only a few pages in his memoirs, but he writes about it in his memoirs. And what he writes here, I just want to show you. He writes here that having to be an object of exhibition for the amusement of others not only made me ashamed, but also furious within. He also writes that when him and Alberta, hearing that they were seen as these really, really foreign, strange, strange, strange kids. And I think you also have to imagine that Denmark is very, very white at the time. There are people of color, but, but it is actually very white. So to see two small kids, two black, children was something very exotic. He says, here in Copenhagen, we were almost seen as being some whimsical animals that had probably escaped from the Copenhagen Zoo. This feeling made us afraid, so we were scared of going out of the streets and being seen. And he explains that they live very near Tivoli, and they have to, so, so they come every day, there's a housemaid who come and take the kids and walk them to Tivoli. And it's a very short distance, and it takes really, really long because everyone gathers around them. So he says, when the young girl appeared on Copenhagen Town Hall Square, which is right next to Tivoli, with us two black children, a crowd quickly formed around us. All of the passers-by forgot their original errands. Pedestrians, cyclists, and even tram passengers gathered around us to see the strange creatures the young white girl was holding by the hand. They did not really believe in our authenticity, and many would wipe their thumbs across our cheeks to see if our black color would rub off. Others shook our tufts of hair to find out if it was a, if it was a wig or real genuine Negro hair. So, so I think it's also imagine two they're really small children who are just being exposed to a lot of like physical attention that must have been really, really scary. Um, he also writes that when he becomes a teacher, he hates taking his student to the zoo. Because, as he says, I remember all too clearly when I was sitting behind the bars. Because he does end up behind bars. And the reason why they do that, because first, so first the exhibition places, there's Mr. Smith with his animals, and there's the bar with the lady serving, and then there are these two small children who are supposed to be sitting over here playing. But they, do, they don't do that, the kids, and they don't behave. They don't just sit over there. And he writes also that he, um, about his behavior, and this is a longer passage, where he says, so, so the children are sitting over here, and everyone comes to look at them and, and touch them. So he says, one time a fine gentleman came holding the hands of a little girl dressed in white. Since she was about the same size as me, she was probably the same age, and her father's plan for the little girl and I, and the father's plan was for the little girl and I to hold each other's hand while he immortalized us in a snapshot. Although the little girl was adorable and in a modern sense attractive, I was stubborn and would not give her my hand. And when she reached out to grab my hand at her father's request, I sent a guff of spit that hit her white dress. Before I had the time to sense anything, her father threw himself upon me and gave me a beating that made me fly across the floor. And obviously, to the surrounding audience member's expression of disapproval at the satisfaction he gained, he went about his way with a girl by the hand. So he is not behaving well, as he should. He's spitting and refusing at the audience. But the most troublesome thing he does, 
the most problematic and troublesome thing he does is that he's supposed to, the exhibition is very well organized. There's Greenland, there is Iceland, there's the Danish West Indies, and there's the Fairy Islands. West Indies is from the brochure from the exhibition. So the West Indies part has these like furniture from a plantation home, and then it has this um, Mr. Smith and the children and the bar. And then there's the Greenlandic part, which I don't know if you can see it. It's a sledge, and they're dogs, stuff, not real, but like stuffed dogs. And Victor all the time runs from West India to Greenland. So he is really disrupting this like very straight idea of, of this is the north, this is the south, because this little, bla little black boy keeps sitting there riding the sledge with the Greenlandic dogs. And that's actually the main reason he ends up behind bars. It's because he keeps going to Greenland. Um, and, and what happens then is that putting them behind bars creates a great, great sensation. And this rumor starts about that it's because they're so savage and wild that they need to be kept behind bars. And it just makes like lots and lots of audiences go to the exhibition and attend them. Um, so it's, it's this combination of, of him running off to Greenland and really disbehaving by spitting. Um, and and when, when I've, I mention it here, it's, it's because I actually think it is really important because not only does it show his discomfort, but it also shows his rebellious side and, and him refusing to behave and refusing to be put in, in the place and refusing to, um, to just being taken pictures of. He writes when they put them in the cage. They brought, they brought in a cage. Alberta and I were placed in it and the audience at the West Indian section grew larger than ever before. Perhaps because the rumors that we were dangerous cannibal children who must not be set free. Alberta, who was very docile, acquired many a great treat during the day. But I, who turned quite desperate at this confinement, rewarded every approach, be it friendly or unfriendly, with the exact same confession, a well-aimed glove of spit. It was not very nice, but I had no better means at the time to maintain my dignity. And in a way, I actually think, and of course, this is in retrospect that he writes it, but in a way, I actually think it's, it's also very brave behavior of, of a very young little boy who is alone um, to, to rebel in this way. And, and I also think it's important to, to think of this rebellion because a lot of the time when we think of the exhibition, we, we think of the people people being very passive victims, and of course, they're being exploited. But there was a lot of resistance. There was also another famous exhibition was a Chinese exhibition in Tivoli, where the Chinese went on strike, refusing to being exhibited, and left Tivoli, because they were not happy with their payments. So, so there are these examples of, of rebellion and, and of, of acting against uh, how they're supposed to, um, to be. Yeah. So, to finish and conclude, um, a lot of, of, in many ways, these exhibitions are a forgotten chapter of the Danish history and the Danish colonial memory. Very few people know about them. Um, they're not taught in the school. Um, and similarly, the details of Victor uh, are, are rather forgotten. Like it, it's, it's become this almost like happy story of a man who went to Denmark and became a teacher and a musician, and, and um, now he has this famous grandchild who is a musician. So it, in a way, it has become a very happy story. Alberta is forgotten. She's written out of history. Um, and, and I was just, um, Frandel Gerald from the, the Shan just showed me this, which is from the, um, the St. Kreuz this week, which also has this, um, you know how it always has this uh, page about Denmark-Danish connection, and, and which has this very little thing about Victor saying this, the amazing faith <coughs> of Victor Cornelins, who as a child was sent to Denmark for an exhibit and remained there. And the picture, which is the exact same picture as the one I showed you, has cut out Alberta. 
is that we only have this one picture of them as children. So the exact same. So Alberta is, is somehow just forgotten out of that history. So, so what I would like us to was if, if we could have a conversation about what does that mean? Like what does it actually mean that we now, at least in Denmark, we have this happy story of Victor. We have no, Alberta is, is completely forgotten. We don't even know where, who she is, what she was. Um, and, and what are the consequences of this? And especially, I think, what, what are the consequences of these Danish collective memories? What do they do to our relations? Like, what do they do to the relations between Denmark and the West Indies? But also, what do they do with them? I don't know. But, but would we have a, a different way of, of doing tourism here? If, if people knew this story, would we have a different way of interacting if, if people knew this story? And so I thought if we could talk about that, it would be very nice. But thank you so much for listening. And now I have talked a lot. And now I'll stop. But I think it's worth by mentioning that also Victor be became one of the Danish heroes. So when they had an exhibition years ago, they had a picture of all the Danish heroes. He was right up there. Up front. He is considered as a hero in Denmark. The same girl that he spit on, years later he was given a lecture. And when everyone left after the lecture, there was a woman sitting in the back of the room. And he asked her what she wanted. And she said that she was the same girl that he spit on, and she apologized to him for the actions of yeah. her father. And as for Alberta, she was living in a house not too far from where Victor lived in Fredericksburg. Her mother's last name was Edwards, and she also had a brother by the name of Herman Roberts. And then her mother had other children for Johannes, a Jacob Johannes, uh, which we had a sibling before, after she was sent to Denmark. And then, um, I think she's buried in a sister cemetery. Yeah. But I think it's not there anymore. She was buried there, but it's, it's, not, it's so long ago okay. that her grave is not there anymore. And then he also had a brother by the name of Frank that he corresponded back and forth. And that Frank, um, he became a police here in St. Croix. I, I knew him as a child. And I would call him Crown Prince. Uh, that was the nickname. He had a very tall man. He was a police. And is that Alberta's brother or Victor, Victor's brother? But do, do you know anything about what the mothers were told? No. No. But yeah, I've, I know about the story with the girl coming back, which is it's a very nice ending of, of that story. A very nice, yeah. Apologizing. Yeah. A lot of the format, they were given uh, children young girls to go to Denmark to study nursing. Uh, my grandmother was supposed to go to them, but her father said not such a thing. And she was born when she was 18, uh, 60 or something like that. Sort of but and did, did they go or there were plans of... She didn't know it. She didn't know, but did the uh, other... other yeah. And the same thing happened to, uh, this was, uh, Benison from Fredrikstad was born around about 1890-something, uh, and also uh, they wanted them to go. And his mother, known as uh, Mahate, he said, you didn't even go anywhere. That other Fredrikstad. Mm -hmm. I know. I don't know. I really don't know. I because I think he stays. Yeah, but he was him and Alberta was living together. And then, when she died, was but they live. They live in a foster home, so they live with a family. Um, and I don't. She was about sixteen when she died. Fourteen, I think. I think she's fourteen when she dies. Fourteen or fifteen, to be yeah. Um, 
So yeah, so then I presented it to to lots and lots of people, like high school students, to teachers, to unions, to academics, to like, all kinds of audiences all over the country. And it's it's a lot of the time what I get is that people laugh a lot. And I interpret that as that it's very uncomfortable and therefore you don't know how to react and therefore you laugh. Um, and, and also, be, and, and, but also that it's a very, very long time ago. So, so in a way also this like, how strange that we could do that, or how crazy that we could do that. Um, and, and in that way, making a distance to it. Um, and I also, and I think it depends very much what, what the audiences are, because a lot of, of what I worked on also is sexuality, and I worked a lot on how the women, especially women of color, are put on display in extremely sexualized ways, uh, and, and really being, and, and you'd have all these comments, um, all these exhibitions are, are being reviewed, like you review film and theater today, so you'd have all these extremely uh, sexualized comments about the women on exhibition and complaints if they're, if they're not naked enough, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and when I present that to um, an audience where you would have women of color, you would sometimes have, I've had the women leave the room because it's so uncomfortable, they would have all these things giggle at, at what is happening. Um, so I think it very much depends on, on where you, who you present it to. But, but mainly, and I think also, I've talked to also um, uh, Axel Frank Larsen, who made the films, uh, also here about his, like the reactions he get when he present that work in Denmark. Uh, and, and I think, I thought when, when he first made his films, I thought it would like create this uproar of, of really like change a lot of things. And he was so surprised that a lot of what he met was silence. And, and I think in the same way, a, a lot of, of what I mean, it's not silence, but it is that it's not connected very much to us. It's a very long time ago, uh, and, and it's, it doesn't really have so much to do with us today. It's, I think that's the main. But also, not only, but also a lot of interest and a lot of, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so after, after doing this research and studying this, I, I, I want you to comment about what it's the, uh, the experience of the Danes to have these human exhibits and how they thought, how they portrayed human beings who were different, especially people of color, just being put in a cage and the, the comments made about him. What does that tell you about the Danes at that point in time? That's one question. Their way of being in the world, their way of seeing themselves in relation to others. And secondly, where has that spirit gone? Has it just vanished? That spirit that was there when Victor was alive, has it gone underground? Has it dissipated? Is it, does it find expression in contemporary Danish culture in a different way today? It is still alive and well. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on it. So I gave you two questions. Yeah, and, and I'll start somewhere else, <laughs> but I'll get to it. But it's because before I was doing this, I was, I was working on contemporary debates about immigration. And I was working a lot about how those debates with politicians and in media are very racist. Um, and that was a very, and I worked especially on like um, Muslim immigrants and, and debates about women who covered, the Muslim women who covered their head, and, and that was just a very political, intense field to be in. And, and then the further I went in my academic career, the more I was also like in the media and in the TV, and then it turned out whenever I had been talking about contemporary racism and contemporary racist issues, I would, I would 
in the end, I hated going to work because when I opened my email, I just had tons of hate mails and I began receiving death threats and I was attacked publicly after I'd been on TV saying that I think we have a racist problem. So then I was like, I, I cannot deal with this anymore. I'm gonna go back in time because it's okay to say we were racist 100 years ago, but I'm also gonna go back to find out what, what's the background of what we have today. So that was part of why I, I wanted to do this about the Danish race science. So I think there is a very, and I think that will answer your question, I think there's a very clear connection between our past and, and that idea of a racial hierarchy and what we and the way we think today, even though we phrase it extremely differently. Because you did in the 1800s have, I, I believe, in, in a biological racism. And we don't have that anymore. But, but we have, for instance, our immigration politics, which would talk about culture or religion in an extremely similar way as, as you would talk about biological race in the, in the 1850s. Um, so I think that is a, a very, um, I think that, that our history, that we carry our history with us, but I also think the problem is as long as you don't know it, you keep carrying it with you. Uh, I, I think this idea of, of um, the white European male and on top of the hierarchy, of, of course, mirrors our, our immigration politics, but also white privilege today. And I don't think we have very much knowledge of that, and I think part of why we keep refusing acknowledging our colonial history is also because that would involve acknowledging a white privilege that is painful to acknowledge. But I think there is a difference in how you phrase things and how you set things um, with, with Victor and Alberta in a way that you would not say it anymore. So there is a, a very uh, direct form of racism that, that I don't think you have in the same way anymore. But, but I think if, if you would ask uh, any woman of color living in Denmark, she could testify to that she's not put on display and being sexualized, but, but the sexual approaches that she gets is, is, is really tough and has a very long history. And the problem is if you don't know that history, then it becomes very individualized and then it becomes you that something is wrong with you and, and not actually that you build on, on a history. Is that answering it? Yeah. Yeah. You're saying that gays are racist today? I'm, I'm saying that if you look at the way that our media currently and our politicians currently talk about, for instance, Muslim immigrants, uh, I think we have a serious racist problem, yeah. I'm not saying everybody. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing some kind of generalizing, but I think the way we talk about, for instance, that we don't want to close our borders to anyone from Syria because they are potential terrorists is a very generalizing way of, of viewing refugees from a war. But actually, the other thing I, I want to say also to your question is that I've also been working a lot with, um, I, I find that there are two different discourses in, in the exhibition because one thing is what the scientists argue and how they put on display people being really primitive and you build these huts. Um, but the other way is, is that a lot of these people stayed in Denmark. A lot of them stayed and married Danes. So from a lot of the exhibitions you would have so you'd have like the, the Chinese exhibition in Tivoli, you had uh, 18 people staying in Denmark, most of them to marry the Danish lovers. Because while they had been on this exhibition, they had talked to everyone working in Tivoli and formed romantic relationships. So, so, I'm also, so I also think it's important to, one thing is that you on, officially you have a, um, a discourse saying that there's a hierarchy and you also officially say that people should not intermarrying Mary, but people did it anyway. And, and I think that discourse is, is very different also. So I also think on some very kind of like ordinary daily life in Denmark, then you might have had really prominent uh, anthropologists writing about how backwards these people were. 
but at the same time, you, you had the woman working in the restaurant next to where they were being shown who went on a date with them and ended up marrying one of them. So, so I think it, it's, there's always a difference, I think, between what, what do you say on a very official level and then what do you have as a scientific idea about who you should marry and what you should do and then what people always go ahead and do. Which I think is a, an important part of that history also. It's hard to, I, I don't know, it's, it's a very hard question. This like, do you think it's racist? Because it's like, if I say yes, all conversations stop. If I say no, all conversations stop. I'm born right before the Second World War. And the Libra occupied for five years. And when you go back to 1946, 47, Denmark was building complete new, secure, safe society. Now this is being invaded today. So now people, uh, whatever they work on, build on for 10, 15 years is being uh, torn apart. The Danes will not uh, continue to exist as a people in the years to come, what's going on right now. And there was a strong, we never had any racism in, in the United States schools. We couldn't go to school for the first year because the Germans had occupied all the schools. And we fought our way out of it, and it's no reason whatsoever. But, but I think it's also, it's also about who, I think it's also about how do you view racism. And I think in Denmark there's a very strong tradition of, of connecting racism with intent. So it's very much like what is your intention? Do you think, um, like do I think deep in my stomach? I'm better than you are because I'm white, and then I say you're really stupid, then it's racist because it's intent, but I actually, you, would, you could also argue, I think, that it's not about intent, it's about how is it received. So, so how, not necessarily what do I mean by what I say, but how is it received at the end of the table? And, and I think a lot of the discussions you have in Denmark very now is it's about trying to change that, because you would have, a, like a lot of my university students of color who would say, no, I know that when people um, approach me, so like the, the young women of color, who would say, I know when people keep approaching me sexually, maybe they mean it well, but the way I feel it, it doesn't matter what they mean. So, so I, I think also you can say there was no racism when you went to school, but I think it depends on who you were. And, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not, because um, I mean, you're the same age as my father, I can hear, and he would say the same thing. And, and I would argue, yes, but, but did you ask the girl of color, like would she have the same story? And when I interview, because in this book, a lot of what I did was that I went and found the children and grandchildren of the people who stayed in, who stayed and married, and did so interviewing the grandchildren, and, and how was that story? And some of the grandchildren would have extremely painful stories about growing up in Denmark as a person of color. So, so I think it's, it's not, it's not that, I think it's, it's not either or. I think it very much depends on, on who experienced it. Yeah? Yes. I want to say thank you for coming and giving this presentation and for the discussion because this subject for me is very vexing. And it's in discussing that we can better understand and maybe move forward. But I have two questions um, on your presentation. Earlier in the beginning, you mentioned um, about what the people were told when they went, when they came here to St. Croix to take the children back. Do you have any idea what they presented to from from your research? Do you have any idea what the storyline was that they were told? So that to have the parents say, okay, St. Louis must die? I, 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 no, I, I don't. I, so it's only guessing. This was also what I, what I asked you before, if, if you knew what, what the parents were told. So I think what we, what we know is that the parents were rather poor and that child mortality is extremely high. Um, and my, so, so what I think is that and, and I think one of the reasons why Ford doesn't want the children back on the island is because he must have promised their mothers something. So I think, it, and I don't know, but, but what I think is that 
he has told them that they can go to Denmark, they can get a really good education, they'd have a much better life, they can get a good job, um, but I don't know. I know that he has not told them they would come back because, because he argues, he said, you cannot send them back because I've promised them others they're not, not promised, but I've told them others they're not gonna come back. So, so he, he has, he must have, have told them something about that they would get a much better life or, or they would go there and then that's kind of hard for me to comprehend that I would let my child go that young, especially, and being told that they're not coming back. Yeah. But it's kind of hard yeah. to digest that. And then my, my other... And it, it might not be true. I mean, it, know, it, it, it might not be. It's all supposition, yeah. especially since there's nothing written that you can find. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also because the only thing we have is him saying, I've told the mothers that they cannot come back. And really it might be, I've told the mothers they'd have a great future, so if they come back here, yeah, I would have to pay for that great future and I don't want to do it. We don't know. Because I completely agree with you that it's hard to, to believe. And then you, you also mentioned in, um, when they were at Tivoli, and I've been to Tivoli, it's a, it's a nice place. Uh, so when they were in Tivoli, you mentioned that they performed. What, what do you mean they performed? I, I, I mean that, that all of the, the idea with all of these exhibitions is to give the audience a realistic look of what life in an African village, an Indian village, a Chinese village looks like. So, so I mean they perform as sitting the whole day cooking food taking care of your children, doing like they would have these, you know, like every other hour they would cook. Um, every uh, other, like two times a day, they would like do something with the animals. So that's what I mean about perform. So it's also, you, you might also have people who back in the countries had not these two because they were kids, but others who actually had a regular job. But, but then when they're put on display, their job becomes very much like uh, weaving a basket, even though you might have done something else so back in your... Do you know if they were in a particular situation that would represent St. Croix? No, so I've... Just placed in a village that... No, they were. What we know is, is that the, um, the, ex the, the colony exhibition had four sections. Danish West Indies, Greenland, Fairy Island, and Iceland. And there was, um, and, and in the West Indies, there was, part of it was this like plantation house, which would have like the bed and it would have, um, so it would have the bed, it would have some mahogany furniture, uh, and then there would be a cafe where there would be this West Indian woman serving, and there would be like a, fa there would be like a coconut, a palm tree they had made, and then they would be serving rum, um, and and then you'd have the man with his uh, Mr. Smith with with his animals, and and that would basically be so. Then you'd have people going in and out all day, um, and you could buy a drink, and then you can lay, and you can like be under the coconut tree. Um, so so it's it's like a, a the live exhibition, uh, and then the furnitures. But when I say perform, it's, it's, it's being, you know, that your, your, your daily life, where else you came from, was much more complex, where it's very reduced to you take care of your children or you do a dance or something like that. So that's what I, and when I call it performance, it's because the idea was to, to create this authentic village life, but of course it was not authentic, um, but, but a performance. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, who would know, unless they've been here, that it may not have been authentic, not just for St. Croix, but for China or Greenland? No one, no one knows, but, but it's just more... But I'm, I don't think it's not that it's not authentic, it's just that it's a very simplified version of the life that would in involve yeah, very, it's yeah. But it's also, I, I, it's, it's, I think it's also that most of the time the things you wanted 
people to do were very, very similar. Like for the exhibitions where you would have adult people, you would all the time have the women to do some dances. And, and I think it's, it's, and the women were not necessarily dancers, but you would all that would be like every other hour they would do a dance because that was also in a way to keep an image of what, what is it women do. Um, so that's why I call, I call it a performance because I think it is in a way a performance. And of course, because what else should it be? Um, did that answer? Yeah. yeah. For me, when I, when I hear what you say, it's, it's you know, things seem and it stay the same. They get on a plane and they come to a hotel that's in an artificial environment and they have the dancers and the like that. Anyhow, um, let's say the youngest audience you talk to in terms of this is this is just curious. Teen teenagers. Teenagers. Teen yeah. And the response from the teenagers, it, was it impactful or it just kind of went in the air and came out the other? No, I, I, think it, I think it has an impact. I think it has, and I, and I think it has, um, but, but I'm not sure how it, it, I think it's hard to, to personally connect with the stories. I think it, it for, for anyone, but also especially maybe for children, I think it would have more impact. Not me as a scholar talking, but, but one of the descendants of, of some of, from uh, some of these people talking. I think that's some more, I was visiting um, with some of Dwayne's students today, and I, I just think that, who are going to, to Denmark soon, and I just think having them talking to other teenagers is much more powerful than anything I can ever say or any book that, that any one of us can ever write because it makes it very personal. And it's very hard to, for me, to, to communicate that. Um, but I think, what, I think what does make um, an impression is this, um, when, when I talk in Denmark, I talk a lot about the race science because we tend to have this idea about that race, that Germany, Nazi Germany, were leading in race science, and that they were really, really bad. And, and then when I talk a lot about that Denmark and Sweden were actually, and especially Sweden were like, the way best when it comes to race science, were like forefront way ahead of the Nazis in, in, in doing race science. And I think that makes a very big impression. On, on teenagers in Denmark because it is something they have not connected with themselves, but only with, with Nazi Germany. Um, and I think in Denmark that you also have this, the Second World War was extremely, extremely terrible in, in all kinds of ways. And after the Second World War was also like a new beginning or what, what you might say. And a lot of, of what we, think about with racism and biological racism is kind of placed in during the colonies and, and during the Second World War. And, and we kind of tend to, to connect it with that time. So, so I think making these connections back in time are quite important for, for understanding today. Uh, looking at the two questions you posed at the end, how do you answer them? What are the consequences of this <laughs> What does it say, what does the connected memory say about racial relations? I think that was the second question. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but, but I think there is something to be said about what, what histories do we remember and what do we forget. And I also think that goes with, with Victor and Alberta. Like, why do we remember one and have completely forgotten the other? Is that because the other story is very painful? It's a little girl who's four, she's taken away, she dies. We forget about her. It's, it's a very painful story, I think, for anyone who has a child. And it's a different story. It's a painful story of a little boy. But he becomes a teacher and he becomes a musician and it, it, it has a happy end, even though it might not be a happy end. But, but I think it's, it's like, what do we remember? What do we forget? And, and, I, and I think it will, and maybe this is me being really, really naive, but I think it will. I think it, it in Denmark, you have this very famous uh, children's book, 
uh, about the five small boys from Africa who go to Denmark because uh, the Danes have taken uh, an animal from Africa and they want to bring it back. And then when they come to the zoo, um, all the animals say, no, no, you cannot take the animal back. And then the Danish um, mayor comes and then they come up with a solution that the children should just stay in the zoo and that's a happy end. And it is a very celebrated child book. It's an old book, but it's still being published and it's still uh, being read. Um, and I think that maybe you would not have a very celebrated book about children who happily live in the zoo if you actually know how many of them who did it and, and died during, like Alberta is not the only one who dies. People, the, the first Muslim who is buried in Denmark is someone who dies in an exhibition. The first woman of color who is buried in, uh, in Aarhus, which is the second biggest city, is a little girl. It's a little girl of, uh, of who, is, who is 10 years who dies in an exhibition. So, so I think it, it's, and we don't know anything about that. And, and I also think it would, I also think it would be good for us to know how many people remained in Denmark, because we also tend to have this idea about Denmark being a very homogeneous society and we were not used to any kind of immigrants and then suddenly they came in, in the 60s and 70s. But some people came before. And, and so I just, yeah. I don't know if it's... Uh, someone mentioned earlier, said earlier, what kind of model we have children? Yeah. But it's what kind of human being we want to go to a woman and say, let me take your child to Denmark. You know, I, I, I can't understand how yeah. they feel yeah. like that's a terrible thing. Yeah. Both are modest. It is. Uh, no, adults can go, so I take your baby to Denmark. You know, that's horrible. <laughs> no, no, I think it, it is horrible, and then I think it's... Um, but it's not, uh, I follow you. I mean, I've, I also have children. I'm like, who would send your child away? But I also know it's, it's like, I don't know her condition. Like, well, whatever the condition is, but like Mr. Charlie said, I mean, it was like a demand, according to your presentation. Yeah. It was a demand from this lady yeah. that she has to have no. these children, no. not necessarily those two. No, but, but any, she any, has yeah. To have children. I yeah. Mean, no, and then you come. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not just because it's Saint Croix, but just the humanitarian yeah. side of the thing. Yeah. No. I, again, yeah. Yeah. You know, thanks for the discussion because yeah. it's really fascinating. I think it's you in the green. Okay. Uh, for me, two things work for me. Number one. Yeah. And then the dark side, we don't resist, we just do it. So we just show, you know, he spit on people, and he went to the club of kids, so any kind of reaction that I'm able to positive is more remembered than I'm not mm -hmm. reacting. Mm -hmm. And I think that really works against her, to the dark side. No, I, th I think that's that's completely right. But I'll, but that's also really sad because I think being docile is also a way of surviving. Yeah, it is. It's but I think that the one memory yeah. is the docile. Yeah. It's when you touch back, that people more would more remember you because you get you get a reaction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Counter reaction. When you negative, just like automatically, the father jumps on. But if 
you can grow up here, go to school, go away to college, get an advanced degree, come back to the Virgin Islands, and then learn Virgin Islands history. For a lot of folks, that's what it would be, because it's not in school. Mm -hmm. uh, this empowers me, let's say, to teach my daughter and my son something. And you have to be careful because you don't want them to learn just about man, but they're looking for the cool for man. <laughs> we got plenty of examples of that. Um, so we have the same challenge here. You know, we have the Sun Clear Road that is played often enough that children here repeat the words and they get some connection to that, but understanding that. So I went through that whole journey to come back. In essence, to learn this and a lot of other things that I've learned afterwards. So we have the same challenge here in that sense because you know the young people today, they have a phone, they have games to play and so forth, and you want to teach them history about this, you know, that was so long ago, that's not important. So we have a similar parallel, parallel challenge that you, you express observing in, in that context. Um, look at what's happening let's say, in America, when uh, the question was asked about um, if, if are being, are being racist today. And you can't say yes, and you just can't say no. You can find some, you can find the other. So when you look at the United States, and they tell you 20% of the people believe that somehow we're done a disservice by ending slavery, you know, and you, it boggles the mind that somebody could really think that, well, the fact of the matter is, that's the way they think. In Denmark, and then there are many people, but I'm sure there's some that are so much better. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, uh, good evening, and, and thanks for being here uh, to uh, repeat what Mary said. Live, I'd like to beforehand apologize to you for something I'm going to share, and so that you don't take it personally. But um, I find the Danish brand of racism is full of irony in that because just coincidentally um, there are lots of point to point connections between my personal self, my life and, 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 and Denmark um, and it goes back you know, through ancestry, which does me no favor that I'm related to some of the biggest good for nothings that, you know, live here in the Virgin Islands from Denmark. But also, you kept confusing 2005 and 1905. And um, it was in 2005 that I played at Tivoli. Life would remember that. And I, I got a sense there, and I didn't know this story at the time, but I got a sense there of being on the swing with a local band, the country was nice. And I also know that my grandmother was one of those people who went to study midwifery in Denmark in 1903, and she was there in 1905. Mm -hmm. So all these, these interesting connections, but I also felt most frustration uh, amongst the Danes, um, both in Denmark and here, because for some reason when they're here, there's absolutely an aversion to, to engagement with local people, if you don't know them, if they don't know you. Um, and I found, I found that very, very interesting. The only other time I've seen that in my experience, in my life, is with Asians. They, they don't connect at all uh, as tourists here or any place out there. But the Danes have a very special mechanism. I don't know if it's subscribed to them from somewhere. Uh, but there is this disengagement. I don't know if it's a, a national shame or a national sense of of a part of some special tenants you all have to, to go through for the atrocities. But um, I could not, I, I went back a second time to play music, and it was very, to me it was, it was almost 
offensive. It was almost, um, I was ashamed actually to be there. I felt like I was a mm -hmm. And I am generally one of the most energetic people in, in, in the band. And, um, and so the third time the opportunity came to go back, I refused to go back. Um, I, I, I did not want to go back to Denmark. Uh, I, 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 I'm not comfortable with that Denmark, that Danish psyche for some reason. I don't know what it is. I think that's just yet. But um, in listening to all of this and, 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 and seeing and hearing clearly, uh, you've got to bring your child here. We want two watermelons, we want four books, and we need two little black children or whatever. You know, that says to me a lot about, and I'm not condemning all of the things, of course. I wouldn't condemn life, you know. <laughs> but um, it, there is something there that to me is a lot more uh, pervasive, including in the disengagement and also in the denial. You know, there's a big vacuum there with the things that you just feel it all the time. And um, so I, I want to thank you for dealing with it, but we, we're going to have a firestorm at least, you know, in the next few weeks here when more and more people find themselves having to focus on what really has been the, the sociological impact of the things on the Virgin Islands psyche. I mean, it's, it's going to be big, I think. I, I'm not saying it's going to be war or, 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 or no, it's not going to be a war. <laughs> You know, there's too many, there are too many things that are unsettled still. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for, for even bringing this here, because I, I see too many empty stairs, you know, when the Danes are, and you could just tell that they're the Danes, you know. There, there's a national shame of something, I don't know. But, but can I just ask you, and, and I don't know if, if you can answer that, but, but when you say it makes you really uncomfortable and you feel like you're on display performing in Denmark, what is it that makes you uncomfortable? And I don't know if you can answer it, but, but what is it that makes you uncomfortable? Because there's never been a, a concomitant conversation, dialogue with the Danes. Um, part of my life, I grew up in, in, in Washington, D.C., and had lots of confrontations, not all of them you know, violent or, 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 or I mean, really physical confrontations, with, with American whites. But, but with Denmark, it's, there's this, to me, this whole site, this whole history. My mom gave me stories about her experiences with Danish men. You know, um, my father gave me his version of what Danish men did to him. Um, and essentially, they were like two or three levels below what a human being uh, should have been treated like. And, and, and all these things just, for some reason, it, well, not for some reason, you remember these things. They, mm -hmm. They're just below the consciousness. And so when I experience the Danes as such, as, as a group of people that refuse to watch me in my face, I've never in my experience with Sierra Singapore been told hello by a Dane that doesn't know me. Never mm -hmm. once. Is that coincidental? No. I, 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 I mean, so all of these, you know, swelling things, they're, they're, they're just there below the surface. And um, I, it hit me when you talked about cages, because at some point I, I felt like I was exhibit A. Mm -hmm. Not me, myself, personally, because to be frank, I, I really don't care what the Danes think of me, but, but on the other hand, what is this mentality that they still carry with them as if you know, it's in some knapsack that they got to bring these dumpy fairies plantations that they created here and run by your own monarchy? You know? So I'm sorry. I'm just, no, no, I think it's, it's a very, very valuable comment, and thank, thank you so much for thanks. sharing it. Thank you. And I also want to thank you for 
taking the competition around the mm. Because I haven't yet visited Denmark, my son is leaving on the 17th of March. And I don't know yet much about this trip, except that I know that four students have been invited and a teacher. And that part of it is for them to be there on the 31st for the centennial commemoration of the day. And I'm nervous as a mother, who's 15 year old and never traveled to Belinda, but also nervous because of, you know, all of this. So I, my anxiety grew <laughs> during your presentation. My anxiety has been good. Um, Sorry. But so I'm thankful for your being willing, because I, that's why I asked you what kind of reception you get. And for me, it's been really important in this centennial to bring, I, I am on a part of the centennial commission, and the first thing I said, if you guys are here to plan a party, let me resign now. Because I'm not interested in a party. I was trying to see how can we figure out how to make, um, to use this time period to start conversations of substance and to share information to because I think that's that's what should happen. That yes you reflect and you try to do that as honestly as you can, but you also begin to plan for the next one that you know how how what can we do so that as a people um, we're prepared for the next one of the year. And Mary's gonna regret that she said this, but, but I understand her when she said it. So I'm sitting here and I'm watching your slide presentation and I'm going to myself, how do we turn this into an exhibit? How do we how do we create an exhibit so that more people can know this story? And you know what I asked Jerry, I never said the word exhibit. I just said, Jerry, can you research Alberta? Can you find out who's her family? How you know let's flesh out her story. Because these children were just two children taken from here. I don't know if they were stolen. I don't know if they were given. I don't know if they were promised to return. I keep hoping somebody will find some correspondence. I don't think either, even Mr. Cornelius mentions any correspondence. I know he did come back here and he did get to meet family, but I'm just in that time period. And I, I'm not trained as a psychiatrist. But I wonder about the trauma for these children. At four years to travel what could not have been a short trip, but at four years to be taken from your mother at six, almost seven years, what what does that do to your psyche? You know, um, so was Alberta docile or was she traumatized? Mm -hmm. you know, was she still trying to figure out where is my mother and what happened? You know, right? You know, so that part of it, I don't know. And we took a chance because we were coming, and I had good intentions of calling a good psychiatrist ahead of time. But then I thought I just prayed and I said, "I'm going to call this afternoon." So he's coming. I was like, oh, "Thank you so much." Um, but you know, how do we tell this story, and how do we? help people to deal with, for us, what feels like the horror of it, but also what more can we do with this knowledge? You know? um, so when Mary kind of leaned over to me and said, exhibit, I just pretended <laughs> that Mary was retiring from making exhibit. <laughs> and I thought, I said to her, I said, you see that door there? That's the door where Victor and Alberta's picture needs to because it's our door of no return. And, and, and maybe there's, and, and hopefully others will join in so that this can create, but I do think it's a story that, that needs to be told prominently, that needs to be recorded, that needs to be made available. Um, and with your permission, we'd like to make this available to teachers and to other groups that want to do it. Um, and we need to know what are the tools that have to go with this, so how do you what, what else do you need after you hear this story? Um, I, I understand what Brooke was saying in terms of the reality.
probably been fortunate to be in the right place a couple of times. to build mosques but not to have the um, what are the, the minerals and, and not to call for prayers publicly but you have you'd have mosques and 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 you will um, and you'd also have very beautifully built mosques now but they're not allowed to have these very tall remarks and not to call up publicly for mosques um, because when I was in Aarhus a few years ago I saw a lot of African Muslims and I was surprised when someone told me, well, since Denmark is part of the EU, the European Union, we take in people from Africa and from other countries. But there was also the issue about people from Eastern Europe who was coming in. But, but yeah, you, you're having, I think, all, all, I think the figure is now that you have 12% of the population who are from another country than Denmark. Uh, and, and most of them would be from Germany and Sweden and Norway and the States and so, but you do, you do have Muslims from Palestine, s these days Syria, Iran, Iraq, um, Ethiopia, Somalia, Somalia um, and then you do have quite a lot of Africans from Nigeria, Christian Africans, Nigeria, Uganda, um, Ga uh, Gambia, um, and depending on where, where you, you are in the country because it's also mainly situated in the cities, but but in areas of Copenhagen where you'd have the most, you'd have 20% of the population uh, being non-white, non-Danish. Um, and then of course you would have now all the um, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of, of people who came in the 60s and 70s and a lot of the discussion right now, and, and that's where I think it is I'm not going to say racist, but I think we have a problem um, where we have a lot of discussion about who belongs to the country and, and where you keep having arguments about saying if, if you cannot document white ancestors back to your parents of a great grandparent, you cannot be a part, you cannot be included, you cannot be a, a part of, you cannot call yourself Danish. And I think that is a very, very problematic exclusive and then also discussion that really is about whiteness uh, and, and about the, the, the historical privileges of, of belonging if you're white. Um, and I think, but this is taking it to a very different level, but I was talking to today earlier to Dwayne's students about that I think part of why it's so complicated for Denmark is because the way we have built our welfare system 
is built on an ideology of that we're equal. So it's, it's really, I think, within our bones and the way we're raised in kindergarten and school and all the whole way through is that we are Scandinavia, it's a welfare system, everyone is equal. And I think part of, of acknowledging that maybe we might all be equal, but some of us are constantly stopped by the police and checked and others are, are always, you know, someone are always stopped in customs and then people like me just go by without any problems. I think part of actually acknowledging how our bodies carry with them colonial privileges or, or colonial uh, discrimination is also acknowledging that this whole ideology that we build Scandinavian welfare systems on might not be that we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. It's, it's taking the discussion to a very different <laughs> direction, I know, but I actually think part of it is because the ideology of, of the Scandinavian welfare system is so fundamentally about that we are an equal society. And I think that's really hard to admit that you might not be. I, I want to end also saying that I really, really want to thank you. Sonia, I really want to um, thank you for, for inviting me and I want to thank all of you for coming and I want to thank all of you for, for the questions and comments and it has been very, very nice for me to be here. So thank you for that. token um, landmarks owns a lot of books owns a copyright to a lot of books that are written sometimes from a colonial perspective so I think as a researcher you will appreciate these in a different way um, some of what's been written by and about people from the Danish West Indies uh, by Danes who were here for a time and so on so I'm going to share those with you thank you so much you. Tanya. So thank, thank you, you. Thank you. To all of you, I want to say this is a journey that we just started. We're going to follow Victor and Alberta, hopefully throughout this year. Um, we've asked George Dyson to take us to Prince Street to look at the places that matter and look at their, the places where they were born. Jerry, as I mentioned, has been researching Alberta and has found her baptism, um, found her death record also, and some information about her family. We're hoping to be able to expand on that um, and to understand. We have the DVD of, um, Ricky mentioned the documentary that Frank, Alex Frank Larson did. Um, it's called Slaves in Our Family. And there's an episode on Victor Cornelius. Mm -hmm.